Hello and welcome to Hexed Encountered. My name is Joe. It's February and that means a new theme for the month. And the theme this month is going to be Flying Pig February. So while I'll probably do some other stuff, maybe outside of the uh, Flying Pig catalog, the primary uh, feature this month will be the games from Mark H. Walker's Flying Pig Games, possibly something maybe even from, his, from the other uh, sibling company, the, uh, the smaller publisher, which would be Tiny Battle Publishing. Um, but in general, what the, uh, what the initial outline for this month will be is I'm going to try to feature at least three of the more big box type uh, Flying Pig Games offerings. That would be the one you see right here, Mark H. Walker's Platoon Commander Deluxe, The Battle of Kursk, designed by David K. Van Hoos. And this is obviously... Uh, you know, covering the uh, the bat the famous Battle of Kursk, the you know the largest tank battle in history, and all that stuff. So it's a platoon level tactical game, and uh, I've played in this system before. There are several other games in this system, some from Tiny Battle Publishing, and uh, the Long War, which is kind of the World War Three with a twist that I did in a previous video series. Also uses basically this same system. So I'm fairly familiar with the system, and so the plan is to play, you know, one, two or so scenarios out of here, maybe one from the base game and one from the Tracks in the Mud expansion, and then move on and do, do Armageddon War in a similar fashion, and then uh, probably wrap it up with the, you know, the big game piece being um, Old School Tactical. So that's the plan, and Old School Tactical will be Old School Tactical Volume 3. And if I have time, I might do something else like Crowbar or um, maybe something from Yaw Magazine or something like that. So uh, there'll also be a digital a digital game as well. And uh, per perhaps I'll talk about some of the tiny battle things and maybe play a tiny battle game as well. Because I do have several of those and they share a lot of DNA with Flying Pig as you would expect. As I mentioned, this is the, the first game we're going to get started. We're going to play actually just scenario one. So it's really basic. Um, because if you have not seen this game before, this is a fairly straightforward game. There's not a lot of rules overhead in this game. The system, um, you know, it, it plays really, really quickly. In my opinion, there's not a whole lot of, you know, uh, rule exceptions and things to look up and things like that. You get... Uh, you get one player's player aid card, two-sided. You, know, you have your terrain effects on one side. All very, uh, very easy to understand. You have uh, leg and armored fighting vehicle stuff. There are column shifts on the other side is the, uh, the, the combat result table, the fire results table. And you use columns based on the firepower rating of the attacking unit. And you basically you shift depending on ter things like terrain and, def and you know, defense ratings and things like that. So really straightforward. There's ranges that are based on colors. And then you look and you see short range, normal, long, etc. So this kind of, you know, everything in here. And then, of course, we also have close assault. So this has everything you would expect in a tactical game. And uh, the system is really well designed, in my opinion. I've played it before, obviously, and I enjoy it. So... We are going to get underway with uh, with scenario number one. Okay, scenario one, take the high ground. It's July 4th, 1943. Elements of the Gross Deutschland Panzer Grenadier Division moved forward with orders to take the high ground. Once the high ground was taken, artillery observation posts would deploy to prepare for the main assault. So, uh, obviously this game, based on, your, based on its name, you know it's about the Battle of Kursk, so... The, the scenarios kind of take you through the through the battle, and there were two uh, two areas of operation: the southern area and the northern area. So our first scenario is the northern area. The Germans are setting up, kind of as it says, an observation post. They have to take a hill, which is currently occupied by uh, four Soviet infantry units, as you can see down here, and uh, they are going to assault it with infantry, basically from the, uh, the Gross Deutschland Panzergrenadier Division. 
to, to take the hill, set up an OP that they can then use for the rest of their offensive. And here we have the hill. We have four infantry units on here. So they're all identical. Uh, the, the, the factors, I'll explain the factors and what they mean as far as what the numbers are in all these spaces, just for anybody who has not seen this system before. But they are, they cover what you would expect, movement and all that stuff, movement, fire factor, close assault, etc. So they have four. They are on a hill. The terrain in these two hexes is forest, which will give column shifts. And so column shifts to the left decrease um, decrease the effectiveness of the attack while column shifts to the right do exactly the opposite. So forest gives you uh, a two column to the left shift if you are, um, it's direct fire and one column shift to the left if it's indirect fire, also known as artillery fire. So that's, uh, that's, their, that's the Soviet setup. Again, this is a fairly basic scenario and it shouldn't take too long to go through it. Now down here at the bottom, we have our German forces. So infantry, the, uh, their, their abilities are basically the same as those of the, of the Soviet infantry. Infantry is infantry, as you would expect. We also have some, um, some 251s here, some uh, half tracks basically that carry the, uh, that carry the infantry. So we do have um, four of those, one, two, three, four. And the setup, you're not using the entire, this is map A, we're not using the entire map, we're just using part of it. Uh, hex is basically 11 A, row A down to row K. So A through K, and there, the map runs from hex one essentially down to 12. So the Germans are starting on this uh, southern, southern edge, I guess. And well, at least the bottom edge, let's just say bottom edge. Because as far as the compass goes, we might be attacking. I think we're attacking south, actually. So they're, they're on the bottom edge. The hill is up here. So the, going up the map is the hill. So we're going to advance. We will fire. This is also a game that uses cards. Each, each, turn, uh, each side, rather, or each player. It is a two-player game. I'm playing it uh, one, you know... Playing it solo, but I'll be playing both sides to the best of my ability. This is uh, something I've used in other, the other games in the system, and it works well. This is very much a game that you can play solitaire. It's best as a two-player game, but you can certainly play it by yourself if you uh, do not have an opponent. So, uh, as I mentioned, you use cards to kind of uh, basically give yourself advantages. It gives you things like artillery strikes and things like that, so... Um, amongst other things, that there's a wide variety on the cards. So you'll see the cards and everything here when we get underway in a moment. So I just wanted to kind of go through one last thing before we start playing. So over here we have our sequence of play. You determine initiative, which is done via dice off, basically. Draw your action cards. Then we have a rally phase. And all these phases should be, you know, the bulk of these are going to be fairly uh, familiar to you if you play tactical games, obviously. Uh, rally phase, right? So we try to rally the units that are disrupted, basically, is what that involves. Fire phase. So the mechanics of the game are interesting in that in the fire phase, the, the side with initiative will fire first. And so they fire one unit, then the opponent fires one, and they go back and forth until everybody's done firing. Then from the fire phase, you go to the movement phase. So if you fired, you basically, in most cases, are precluded from movement. There are some cards and other things that can allow you to move after fire. Um, but in general, you have to be an eligible unit, which means you have not moved or fired to be able to do most actions in the game. Uh, so once you do movement, one side moves, the side with initiative will move, and they'll move everybody, and then the other side will move everybody. And there's also opportunity fire, as you would also expect in a tactical game for, again, eligible units or units that you can play a card on to make them eligible. So that's where these action cards come in. So you can have, you'll move your units and the enemy, if they have units eligible to fire, they can fire at you and opportunity fire. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Again, very, very, very uh, familiar in, ger in terms of maybe not mechanically because the mechanics of the game are... You know, not the same, obviously, as other other games, but 
the the basic thought and and idea behind all of this is you know straight up what you would expect on a tactical game right so after movement, you have close assault phase. So if you are adjacent to an enemy unit, you can you can assault them. Housekeeping phase, basically we clean stuff up. Uh, aid and focus phase. So you have aid and focus uh, counters, which are down here, right here at the bottom. And you can put them, each, each side has one of each. You put them out on the map in a hex. And basically the way they function is they... Uh, in terms of focus, that's that's a unit that you as the commander are kind of um, prioritizing. So they maybe they get it's it's abstracted, but they get a little bit of an advantage. They get better ammunition or more ammunition or et cetera, et cetera. So I'll go into that when we get to that phase, like what that means and how you use it and so on and so forth. But just know that that's a way to kind of prioritize specific areas of your forces, specific units in your forces. Um, there's, there's rules on, uh, you know, how you can use them, what they do, obviously, of course. And, uh, they come in two, basically two strengths. You have a two die side and a one die side. So basically you roll die and you can do things like re-roll for certain things. They can help you gain initiative. There's a pretty decent variety of things that these, that the focus, um, marker does and the aid marker, um, also has special abilities that enable you to kind of maybe recover from something bad happening to you or whatever. So we'll talk about that as we get to it, but I did want to mention it. And then, of course, the last thing is we advance our turn marker. You can't really see it here, but we do have a turn uh, counter with the Soviets on one side and the Germans. It's sideways, sorry. Germans on the other side. So obviously we will start at turn one. Every scenario has a certain number or number of turns and you play through the game that way. So that will do it for setup. I am going to kind of reset my shot here and we will get to play in some uh, Platoon Commander Deluxe Battle of Kursk. Normally we would be rolling for initiative to, de to well, to determine initiative in on the first turn. In this case, we don't do that because our scenario dictates that the Germans start with initiative on turn one. So beyond that, we will we will uh, do our dice off and roll for initiative as we move forward. Now we draw our action cards, and the Soviets start with two cards, and the Germans start with no cards. And then each time, each turn after turn one, they'll get two cards each. So here's our deck of cards. You take two, and there's uh, these are bonus cards, like a secondary, um, you know, just additional cards, basically. So here are our two Soviet cards. We can look at them, and so every card will have a German section and a Soviet section. Partisans, so obviously Red Star, Soviets. The, uh, the, the Maltese Cross, Germans, right? So Partisans and Minoye Pole. Um, so... This is a minefield, so you can place a mine minefield within two hexes of any non-disrupted Soviet leg unit. And then this is, the, it also tells you what phase. So any means any phase. Housekeeping means housekeeping phase, right? Makes sense. So designate one German unit. No marker may be removed from the unit. So we keep this, obviously, because it's not the housekeeping phase. But this one we can we can play. If we want to put a minefield in play uh, to help the, these guys defend their position. So it's within two hexes of a, of a non-disrupted Soviet leg unit. So these are all Soviet leg units. We can put a minefield. So I'm going to put the Soviet cards off here on the bottom to the side. And I'll probably keep the Germans over here closer to maybe where the dice tower is. Just so I have them separated and I can keep track of which one is which. Next up is the rally phase, which we don't need in turn one because nobody's disrupted. And so then we would move to the fire phase. Now, here's a good point to talk about what the, uh, how, the, how the counters are structured. For our demonstration here on the counter, we will have, the, uh, we'll have our half track here because it's got all the factors that are pertinent to gameplay. And our infantry unit, which is this guy right here, doesn't have our factor up here. So what does that mean? We're going to find out here in a second. So basically, 
Starting up here in the upper left corner, this is our armor piercing firepower. So obviously that indicates its effectiveness at attacking armored fighting vehicles. With a minus two, uh, that's bad. The color of the box indicates its range. So here on our range explanation chart, right up here, you can see black is adjacent only. So it can only attack an armored unit in the next hex. And its firepower will give you a minus two, which is this column right here. So um, it's not particularly effective, obviously, against an armored fighting vehicle. Infantry, on the other hand, is a zero and a black. Um, so they're also adjacent only, but actually infantry are a little bit more effective against an armored fighting vehicle than this guy right here. The, the, the bottom left number, the four in the green, is our high explosive firepower. So that's its firepower against leg units. So the soft units, the flesh and bone guys, etc. Uh, again, the green refers to the range. So green is kind of uh, like normal. Uh, short, it's short range, essentially. It's not particularly long ranged, as you would expect. From units equipped with rifles. Uh, generally speaking. Next to that, we have our movement factor. That's just the number of hexes it can move, and it's because it's circled, it means it can carry another unit. So it's a carrier, right? And what you would expect. This is basically an APC. Uh, on the right here is its um, close assault factor. So that, re that basically indicates its effectiveness when it is involved in an assault. So it has a four there, which is, um, you know, not great, but not terrible, I guess. Infantry, on the other hand, they have an eight. So just for comparison's sake, you can see that their firepower is identical. The infantry, obviously, walking, they cannot cover as much ground as a motorized vehicle here. And infantry is more effective in a close assault than our half-track is. Now, the top right is its armor. Obviously, infantry does not have armor. This guy does. It's two, so it's not great armor, but it does have armor. The minus one, the superscript here, that is a die roll modifier. So if the Soviets are attacking this guy, they would, we would, um, you use the factor to, to determine the column adjustments and so on. And we'll get into that when we do combat, but you'll apply a minus one die roll modifier to the, to the dice roll. So that is in a, in a nutshell, how the counters are set up. Back to the matter at hand, the fire phase, okay? So all of the units in this scenario have a green range. So if we look at our range chart here on the player aid, okay, these are the number of hexes. So to be at short range is one hex, to be at normal range is three, to be at long range is five. None of our units are within five hexes of each other. Therefore, we're not really going to even have a fire phase in turn one, as you would expect. So we will now move on to the movement phase. So the difference in the fire phase and the movement phase is in the fire phase, you alternate units side to side. So the Germans had initiative, they would get to fire first, then the Soviets would fire back one unit, and then the Germans and then the Soviets and so on and so on until either you pass or both teams have expended all their eligible units, can, nobody else can fire, etc. Movement's different. Movement, the phasing player, the initiative player gets to go first and then the other one and move everybody. And then the other side goes and they move everybody. So we have our infantry that are afoot. They can move two hexes so we can go like this. And you also have to account for the terrain. So here's our terrain. So most of the terrain here is clear. But if we look at our terrain chart, Okay, we've got this, this stuff right here. So that is rolling, but the movement cost is still one. And it asks, uh, you know, this gives you all the info, right? You have blocking, does it block line of sight? The movement cost for leg or vehicle. And then your column shifts, basically your cover is what this, this is for fire combat and close assault. So everything is... Uh, is laid out real easy. So as I mentioned, this game is not overly complicated. Here's our fire result table. Here's our range. Here's our close assault. On the back, we have our terrain all laid out really nice. 
tells you what it is, nice examples, whether it blocks line of sight, etc. You have some exceptions at the bottom, but it's all very well laid out and it all makes a lot of sense. It's one of the great things I love about this system is it's not all that hard to pick up. So we're going to move our infantry up too. Now this guy is in a carrier. He can actually move five. One, two. Now you have a uh, an increase in elevation here. Here on our chart, you can see hill, and uh, it's a plus one to higher elevation. So we get one for moving up to onto it and plus one for, so basically it costs two in this instance. So we have our 251 here with its infantry and we're just gonna pay, we paid one to move here. So we're gonna go two, three, four, five. Now. Well, you might wonder now, right? We have this guy here. Green is a range of three, but, and it's one, two, three. So it's in range, but, 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 this is not a leg unit. So we wouldn't use this factor. We use this one, and that's in a black box, which means he can only attack adjacent targets. So... In theory, if this was just a regular infantry without his carrier, of course I can't pick up one. So if it was just that guy by himself, they'd be able to use opportunity fire to attack him. But they can't because he's inside this guy and so therefore protected and he would need an armor factor to attack, which he has, but we can't do it till he's here. So that's a safe move to do. Now we have regular two more infantry here. Now he can move here, but he doesn't have enough to move up on top of the hill. So I'm actually going to slide him this way. And we'll move this guy and slide him this way. That way next turn we can continue our approach, etc. We do have a, um, a 251 here. So we go one, two three, four, five, and then this guy will go one, two, three, four, five, and wait a minute, one, two, three, four, he should be here actually, I miscounted, then uh, one, two, and one, two, three, four, now here we have a forest, right, so we're at four, and if we check our terrain chart for forest, to enter for a, for a leg unit is only one, but for an armored fighting vehicle, it's two. He's in a vehicle. He cannot enter the forest. So what we'll do here is we'll come behind it anyway. The forest actually provides you some cover. Not that these guys have ranged weapons that can hurt the, the half tracks anyway. So we will, we will just kind of hang behind the trees here. And so that would complete the Germans' movement. And in theory, what you're supposed to do here is just put moved... Uh, it says rack, move. We have most of these counters are two sided, so you have moved on one side, and on the other side, you might have fired or flanked, disrupted. There's, a, there's various things, so the counters are somewhat interchangeable. So, in theory, you're supposed to do this put all these down so you know who moved. We have another one for here. So, all these guys have moved, um, and you know, that would end our movement phase. Oops, I missed one. So they all moved. We go to the Soviets. They are not going to move, but what we will do is we will put our mine field down. So I'm going to put it right here. Okay, so it's within two hexes of these two. And to do that, we use our card. Card is now expended, so we discard it. And we still have our partisans card that we will use later on. So that would end the movement phase. We won't have close assault because nobody's in range for it. We go to the housekeeping phase. So that's when you remove your moved markers. Then we go to our aid and focus phase is next. Okay, so let's place our aid and focus markers. Okay, so these are the Germans. We have a focus and an aid. As you can see, they are, there's, one, there's a two die side and a one die side. So when you first place them, they go on the one die side. And then if you don't use them, you can actually use your action in this phase to flip them to the two die side. 
So we will put our focus on this guy right here because he's the one that's probably going to get in trouble first. And I'll put my aid here. I'm actually going to put him underneath. So we get a little bit of a stack here. Now what the focus marker will let you do, amongst other things, but um, it allows you to re-roll an attack, so that's kind of useful. And the aid will let you re-roll on your um, check. So, so once that's done, we advance the turn marker and we start turn two. And to do that, we would again, let me slide this down so you can actually see the turn marker. You have a little bit of head space here. There we go, that's better. So you would advance your turn marker, we take our dice out, we roll one die for the Soviets, they got a nine, so they're probably going to get initiative. Oh, I forgot to put their focus, and so we'll put this here, we'll give him the focus, and we'll put the aid on this guy. So they have a nine, we roll for the Germans, they get a five, so the Soviets get initiative for turn two. So in most cases you'll roll one die, like for your attack, and then you'd roll multiple dies to try to negate the hits that you get. So since we just determined initiative, step two again is draw your cards. So we'll draw two cards for the Soviets and two cards for the Germans. So I'll put the Germans here, so the Soviets get... Voluminous fire, which you can subtract one from the fire result table dice roll. That's nice. And then Kantarbatar Ogun. I don't know. My Russian's not real good. It's not existent, in fact. Um, again, this determines when you can play it, fire or movement phase. Any phase. German player must discard all artillery cards in their hand. So this card, I because obviously this is a two-player game, now, I will know if the German has artillery cards in their hand. So what I'll do is, when, when this comes up, I will roll a die, and based on the die roll, that would determine whether or not I play that card. That way, um, and if I put them here, I can actually see them all like that. And then I'll, the Germans... So that way I roll... If I get, say, I'll do odds or evens or however many cards I have, whatever, we'll roll and, um, you know, he'll play the card. That that pulls, takes it away from me making the decision because I'm going to know, which I know right now, right? They get schnell schnell, two movement points for a target unit. You can play it in the movement phase. It makes sense. So we'll tuck that up under the board like this. Um, you can't see it, but... Here we'll put it. We'll put it here. So these will be the ger this will be the German side, and then we have op fire in the movement phase. Conduct opportunity fire marker status is unchanged. So basically, you get a free op fire because typically when you conduct op fire, you have to put a fired marker on the unit. With this card, you don't have to do that. So that's nice to have. Okay, so. We did our action cards, rally phase, nobody's disrupted, no need for that. So now we go fire phase, and here the Soviets have the advantage. They would get to go first. They have initiative, rather. But again, nobody in range. So we're going to end up going to our... Um, although, actually... Uh, I'm trying to decide if I should try to fire on... The, on them one two three four it's uphill as well um so at green this would be long range which is a two column shift to the left firepower of four so we'd be in the two column so here right here's our here's our range color we're normal i mean i'm sorry we're green and normal is only up to three hexes, so one, two, three, four. We're four hexes, so we move to long range, and then we have a normal to long range, a two column shift to the left. So our four would get shifted to a zero. So then we're good if we roll anything but a nine. So um, maybe it's worth doing it just so you can see what fire looks like. The problem is I want to kind of advance on these guys. So 
That's why I'm kind of reluctant to, to fire in, in turn two here. So we're going to move on. This is a seven-turn scenario. Um, honestly, my plan as the German side here, the attackers, uh, the Soviet side's easy. They're defending. They want to hold the hill. The Germans need to capture the hill. The plan, obviously, get up there, close assault those positions, and boot the Soviets off the hill. So we're going to skip the fire phase. I'm not going to do op fire. At least not. I mean, I'm not going to do a fire in the fire phase. We might get some op fire, however, because we are going to move these guys up. So our focus marker can move with the unit. So we're going to go one, two, and then we're going uphill again. Three, four. Now we're adjacent. Now the infantry can fire on our our uh, APC here. So what we, we will do at this time... So I'm grabbing myself a fire marker. Here's a fire marker. I'm going to place that on this guy right here um, as soon as I fire. So the way this works is pretty straightforward. It's, a, it's an armored fighting vehicle. So he's got a zero and we get a two here with a minus one die roll modifier. So the two is the armor factor. And then when we roll, we subtract one from the roll. Okay, so because it's an armored fighting vehicle and has armor you get adjustments here. So our firepower is zero. So we're in the zero column to begin with, but then we have to subtract the armor. So we move um, minus two because it's two from zero. So zero minus two is two. So we're in the minus two column. Okay, and then we also get to subtract one from the die roll. So in the minus two column, you don't have a lot of um, damage possibilities. Because obviously the firepower is low. This is the low end of the spectrum. Up here is the powerful, overwhelming end of the spectrum. So we're going to roll one die. And based on that, we're going to subtract one because we have a minus one. We'll subtract one and then that number here will determine what happens. So let's roll one die. And we get a, a, a zero in this game is a zero. <laughs> so it actually becomes a minus one, which is lower than that. So that's actually good because we subtract one, it actually becomes a minus two, but you don't go below zero. So we're at zero, but that's two hits. So we take two dice and we roll them and the German morale is five, as I mentioned a minute ago. So we get a nine and a one. So the nine is a hit and the one is not because anything lower, equal or lower than the morale is negated. So we have one hit so how do we apply our damage is the next point to show here. So the way hits work in this game is that the first hit will disrupt the unit and the second hit will reduce the unit and a third hit will eliminate it. So we got one hit, so that's going to disrupt our unit here. And because it's a transport unit, when you um, target the transport unit, you the, the passenger shares the fate of the carrier. So in this case, that means both the carrier and the infantry inside it are disrupted. So boop, disrupted. Okay, so that's how that works. And so now we would go back to uh, movement. And again, German movement. So these guys can move too. So they'll move up. They'll move up. They will move up as well. Now we know there's a minefield, so we want to avoid that. So one thing I forgot to do here is when you place a minefield during the fire or movement phase, which is what we did, that counts as a fired action. So I'm going to put fired on the top of the first infantry there, just to indicate that they used their action to place this minefield, which just means in this case that they're not going to be able to shoot at this guy who's going to go one, two, which would then bring him in range, well, he'd be three away. So they can do the same thing that this guy did and fire on him as soon as he hits this hex here. So they will do that. And I'm screwing this up because they can't fire because they're not adjacent. And I was thinking HE and it's not HE. So, so we're gonna go four, five, or get pre prepare to flank them anyway. And they have the aid marker as well. So that's that unit's move. So let's drop a moved on him. So we'll put a moved here and here and here, right? So they've moved. 
Now we can move our vehicle through the forest if we want to. It just costs us a little more because as I mentioned earlier, if you move through a forest with a, uh, a fire, uh, an AFV, it's two. So we can do that. We'll go two, three, four, five, which again now will expose us to opportunity fire from this guy, which we will take advantage of that. Pop, pop that there. I'll put a moved marker. I didn't put a moved marker on the disrupted guy. It's not that big of a deal because I know he moved there. Um, but we're going to roll. We got a three. So we know we're using the same as before. We're in the minus two, and the three is one hit. So we roll one die. We roll the three and negates the hit. So he's fired. He has moved. And now we'll move this guy, and we'll do the same thing. Two, three, uh, four, five. And we'll put a move on him. And we'll go uh, two, because he's going on to, up onto the hill, which I think I also have to move this guy back, because he was here, I believe. And then two as well for that. So they move and move. Okay, so now everybody's moved, and now we can go to the close assault phase. So let's talk about the close assault phase. So close assaults basically boil down to odds. Okay, so if we look at the close assault table here, you can see there's odds at the top, you know, two to one, three to one. Obviously, they're better as you go this way and worse as you go to the, to the left. But here's the thing, our uh, transport, the infantry inside it can't fire while they're, while they're loaded into the transport, okay? So they would be unavailable to take part in this. And the transport has a close combat factor of four, while our infantry has a close combat factor of eight. Therefore, it is probably not in the uh, interest of the transport to close assault on this turn. Therefore, we will wait till next turn and hopefully move these guys up as well, and then we'll be able to assault from two areas at once, which, in, which will greatly improve our chances of success. We'll be able to use the APC and the infantry's uh, attack values and make it a little bit more worthwhile. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to end our turn here. So now we go to the aid and focus phase. So we can flip our markers to the two die side because we didn't use them for anything. I don't know what I had on my finger there. We'll do that. And the other one is here. No, where is the other one? Is it here? It is. Flip that over, put that there, and then the Soviets have theirs. He's already on the two side because I put it down wrong, and so is he. So I placed that one wrong. We're just going to leave it. So that's that. We go to housekeeping. Now in the housekeeping phase, we can check to see what our Soviets can do here. They have partisans. So we're going to play this card because what this does, if I can pick it up, Designate one German unit. No marker may be removed from the unit. Let's use it instead on this guy. So we'll leave the moved marker on there because I think that's what that card means. Um, I'm fairly certain. So we're going to leave that on there, which means he won't be able to move up adjacent and do an assault next turn because he's going to be stuck there. Uh, he'll be able to fire, but he won't be able to move. So... Uh, that is, oh, the fired markers. I'm going to remove these guys as well. And now we are ready to advance our turn marker to turn three. We'll roll Soviets first. They got a nine again. <laughs> Germans get a seven. So the Soviets again have initiative. We'll draw out cards. One, two for them and one, two for them. Soviets get sniper attack, disrupt target unit. Target must be within four hexes of and have a clear line of sight to a city, town, or forest hex. So we have forest hexes right here. 
NKVD, rally up to two units, reduce one of them. We're going to hold on to that because that's a really useful card. Um, although you have to reduce, which is no good, but we'll take what we can get, right? Fire and movement phases. So this one is a useful one. And this one is also a useful one, our uh, voluminous fire from the previous one. And then for the Germans, we get another op fire and reallocate resources. And this is good anytime, and this is good in the movement phase. So the reallocation of resources, um, once we use our or lose our aid marker, we'll be able to reapply it there. Okay, so we've done our cards. Um, I'm going to roll to see if they'll use their, uh, their artillery card, because in theory, they don't know what the Germans have. So odds will play it, evens we won't. So we rolled odds, so that we're going to play it. And the Germans would have to, if they had this card, which is artillery barrage, they would have to discard it, but they don't. That's not their card, that's the Soviets' card. So they lose this card and it had no effect. So that's how I'm going to do it in things like where you're playing a card against the opponent and you don't know what the opponent might have. So we'll do that, and that takes care of that. Rally phase. So we're going to attempt to rally these guys. So how does the rally phase work? Well, let's talk about it. Okay, so it's pretty simple. You could have a card to play that would, uh, you know, increase your odds or whatever, but, or automatically rally somebody, like we have this one up here with the NKVD. But in this case, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, roll our die, and if we roll the five for their morale value or less, they rally. We roll the four, so they rally. So the disrupted goes away. So bad news for our friends, the Soviets. Okay, so now we go to the fire phase. Now, again, they're in an they're in an armored vehicle. They're in an armored vehicle, but they are adjacent, so the Soviets can fire at them, and they might as well. They do have initiative, so they would fire first, and then the Germans can fire back because we alternate in the fire phase. So. We'll have this guy fire first, and uh, let me move him so he's a little bit better centered in there. Now, he also has his focus, so if he, if we roll something we don't like, we can re-roll it. But you have to accept it after you do that. So, uh, let's see. We are still in our minus two column, so nothing has changed from before. We roll. We rolled a zero. That's a good roll. Uh, we get a minus one, so it actually goes lower than, lower than a zero. And so that's two hits. So now we take our two dice and we get a five and an eight. So again, it's one hit. So we again disrupt our friends, the Germans there. And now we'll do the same here with this guy. And he rolled a five. So he does not have the focus marker and cannot roll again. So we look at our chart. We're in the minus two column and a four to six is one hit. So we'll roll one die. We get a nine, so that hit is not negated, which means they're also disrupted. So two good rolls there for the defenders. And uh, actually, I screwed it up because the Germans were supposed to be able to fire first. So let's, let's undo. We're going to undo, and we're going to have these guys fire at them. So I screwed that up. Apologies. We're going to have to do a redo here. All right, so now we are far, uh, well, do we want to do that? Um, you know what? I think we kind of don't want to do that. I think we kind of don't want to do that as the Germans because the plan was to close assault. So um, we're going to say that we, as the Germans, passed on our attempt to fire or our opportunity to fire, rather. The Soviets took advantage, fired, disrupted. Okay, they can't fire at anybody else. No one else is adjacent. So we go to the movement phase. They get to move first. They're not moving. Um, so let's move on to the German movement phase where, okay, so let's start here. He's going to move up this hill. There's a hill line here, ridge line, an elevation line, I guess. 
So he's going to move up. So that's two. And he's going to stop there and put a moved marker. Now, these guys can't fire because they're not adjacent. But even if they weren't adjacent, there's forest here, which is a block's line of sight. So he can't see this guy. All right, so that takes care of that one. Now we'll move this guy up two. We'll move this guy up two. We'll move this guy up two. And we'll move this guy like this. And then we'll take our moved markers. And moved, 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 and moved. He still has a moved marker. And we'll leave it at that. I could have, in theory, used him to fire. But I chose not to, which is fine. Um, so we go from movement to close assault. And just like before, except this time, we can't still, we can close assault because we have this guy here. Now, they have an eight, right? Um, since he only moved two, and I should have done this in the movement phase and I forgot. But what I should, what I should have done is he only moved two, which is less than half his movement factor. They can move half their movement factor and then unload the passenger. So the passenger has been unloaded. So we'll put him on top now. So basically what we've got here is we've got an 8 and a 4. And if they were to close assault, let's put the moved marker back on there. If they were to close assault this hex, okay, we have to look at the close assault table. And we have to adjust for the terrain because the defender is in a forest hex. So let's see if this is even worth doing. We have 12, they have 8. So we're going to look for column shifts. So forest... Leg and AFV um, on the defender side. So they get a shift uh, to the left of one column. So you look at your odds. Now you round down. Um, so you would round down. So we'd go to one to one because we would be. Well, you round down, so the 12 to 8 becomes basically 8 to 8. So we're in this column to start, and then we move one left because of the forest, which means we'd be in the 1 to 2 column. Now, the first number is the uh, the number of hits to the defender, and the second column is the number of hits to the attacker. And we are in here, so basically if you roll low, right, um, you really need to roll really low, like... Zero, one. You roll up here and you're going to take a lot of hits. Um, but you know what? We're going to do it because this is more for demonstration purposes than anything else. So I'm going to roll one. We, roll, <laughs> we rolled a nine, which is terrible. So they get one hit. We get eight hits. So with that in mind, we'll roll for the Soviets first. So their morale in this scenario is four. So four or less, no hit. Five or higher, they take they take disruption. Roll the six, so they get disrupted. So we'll put a disrupted on here. We'll put that under the fired. Uh, they have the focus, so they could re-roll. So let's uh, let's do that. We'll use the focus. So we're going to flip it to its one side, and we'll hold on to this disrupted counter and roll again. And they rolled a two that time, so they're not disrupted. So that worked out. That was a good use there. Now we need to roll eight. So I'll roll four at a time since we have six dice. So we need threes or lower. So we have two hits and two negations. Okay, so two, two hits so far. And then we have three, four, five, five hits and one negation. So this was bad. So five hits, and we have to dole them out to the two units that are involved here. Okay, so we have to apply our hits here. So let me remove this for the moment. So both units would take one, which would disrupt. Okay, and then both units would take two, which would reduce. And then we have the fifth hit, which is going to eliminate one of these guys, and you get to choose. So I'm going to keep our infantry and, re and remove our... APC. So he's going to be moved and disrupted and reduced. So not great. It does have the aid marker and he can use that to try uh, to, um, to rally when we go to the rally phase. So that takes care of that. This guy can't assault. That guy can't assault. So we're basically done with our assaults. 
All right, so we go from close assault to housekeeping. So we're going to remove our moves and fires. He would technically have had a fire marker, but I didn't put it on there. So we'll just put these over here. And so then we would move on to advancing the turn to, to turn four and go through the process again. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to end our video because this is a really straightforward, basic infantry only kind of thing. And now I've shown most of the elements. We haven't gotten any artillery attacks or things like that. I didn't use the sniper attack card or... Um, you know, opportunity fire for the Germans is kind of not going to happen because they're not going to move. Uh, I could add two movement points. I could also flip my aid marker, which I can do in any time. So uh, I would do that with my focus, um, etc. So um, basically, I just wanted to do one video where I kind of went through the mechanics and then we'll do a little bit more complicated scenario, maybe from the expansion even. Uh, to, to kind of show something a little bit more uh, in-depth and advanced. So that will do it. I appreciate you watching. Uh, thanks as always. If you have not, please consider liking this video or sharing it, or even better yet, for me at least, subscribing, just so you won't miss out on anything I do in the future. If you do like my videos, um, I would appreciate your support. That would be awesome. But even if not, I hope you enjoyed the video and we'll return and watch some, some more stuff in the future. So for now, that will do it. My name is Joe. This has been Hexed Encountered. It is Flying Pig February, and this is the Platoon Commander Deluxe Battle of Kursk. And we will be doing another feature uh, video on this game here in a couple days. So please check back. And until next time, happy gaming. <laughs>